Hello, Blake Rudis here with another On One Workflow tutorial. And in this tutorial, I'm gonna show you how to take this image that was taken just before sunrise, it doesn't have a whole lot going on with it, and replace the sky and make it look more like an afternoon shot that has a lot more going for it. So here's that before, and here's the after. So in this workflow tutorial, my main focus is going to be on replacing the sky. However, I'm going to show you the entire workflow that I'm going to do on this image. Now, what you're going to see is I'm going to be using some skies that I have that I have put into my version of on one photo raw. But don't worry, because I'm sharing some of those with you. And at the end of this video, at the very end, watch it to the very end, I'll show you how to import those clouds into your version of on one photo raw. So let's go ahead and jump into it. This is the image I'm going to edit. I'm going to go ahead and go into develop. And if <laughs> you're probably gonna be like, man, we're seeing a lot of images of Moab, Blake. You're right, because you know what? I, I actually go places to get source material for my uh, content. I haven't been able to go out very much because I have a, a third child in the house now. So things are a little hectic. <laughs> But I'm going to start out with my typical workflow on this. This is in Moab in the Arches National Park, and this is the Oregon. It's a little bit different view of the Oregon because Hudson and I actually hiked almost all the way around the back side of it instead of the front view like you normally see in the park coming in. So for this, I'm just going to spruce it up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to brighten some things up. I'm going to open up some of those shadows a little bit so I can see into this image a little bit better. And what you're going to see here is that I'm not thoroughly impressed with this guy. Um, the time of day was actually just before sunrise, which is perfect because we don't have a whole lot of shadows in here to give away any of uh, the, the sky that could be there. Typically with sky replacements, I'm going to go ahead and get into this now, the best images to use for that are images that don't have a whole lot really going for it as far as uh, highlights and shadows are concerned because it's easier to fool the eye. If you've got a really harsh shadow beaming down on something and you put a cloudy sky in there, uh, it looks fake. Okay, So this was just before sunrise. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and boost up some of the image here. So I'm going to go right to, uh, let's open up my histogram first and see what I've got going on here. So I'm going to move my shadows over until they start to brighten up a little bit. I'm going to move my highlights down until they start to darken down. That's also going to help us replace that sky in the background. Because I affected my highlights and my shadows, I'm going to boost up my contrast a little bit to reincorporate uh, some of the uh, highlight and shadow information in there. That looks really good right there. My, eh, I'm not going to increase the exposure. I'll just leave the exposure right at zero. Okay. So now I could adjust my white point and my black point until I get a good white and black point. And you know, it's, it's completely up to you. I might move this white over just a little bit to incorporate some more white on those rocks. Maybe make that black point just a little bit darker to incorporate some of those shadows down there. Some people start with their white and black point before going into their highlights and their shadows. It really just depends. I like to start with my highlights and my shadows first because they're less uh, abrasive and they work a lot slower than the white point and the black point. And then after I've used my highlights and my shadows, I can dictate whether I need to incorporate any more of that white and black in there. And one of the things that happens here is that when we adjust these highlights and these shadows, sometimes the structure needs to be fixed here. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit and see what the structure looks like of the tone in that image. I might bring this down just a slight bit because sometimes when you bump up these highlights and these shadows like this, uh, I don't know the word for it. Uh, maybe highly contrast or crunchy. I don't know. I, I think I like a granola bar or something like that. So we'll just bring the structure to negative four. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my white balance set correctly because I want this to look more like an afternoon shot because it was taken in the morning. I don't have a lot of that bright sun that's in the image, but the clouds that I'm going to add to this are going to be necessary for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and slam up my saturation here and see what colors I need to add to this to offset some of the blue on the white rocks. And that would be some yellow. Maybe bring some yellow in there to brighten up those rocks a little bit and maybe even bring some of that magenta out of it. Now, the reason why I brought my saturation up to 100% is it allows me to see what color is the most dominant in my image. And I was able to see that blue was very strikingly powerful in this photograph where yellow was not. You see that? So I'll bump that back up so we can see that. So I think that's all, all good for tone. Now I'm going to move into color. Let's look at the lens corrections. Kind of like what's going on with those lens corrections, although I, I you know, I kind of like that bulbous feel of a of a wide angle lens too. So uh, again, that I might just leave 
Oh, we'll, we'll turn the lens corrections on, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and zoom in because one of the things that will give you away when it comes to a sky replacement are going to be uh, your chromatic aberrations. So I'm going to zoom into the back area here, and I'm going to change this lens correction area down here to manual. And in here, we're going to see the color fringe, uh, purple and green. So I'm going to move this over until that purple starts to go away. See that? Really right over here on this edge. Move this over till that purple fringe goes away right about there and move this over till that green fringe goes away or it gets really close to going away and that looks pretty good right about there still a little bit of chromatic aberration there but it's not as bad as it was so now I've got my tone good I've got my lens corrections dialed in I don't even need to do too much with sharpening with this image uh, it looks actually pretty darn sharp to begin with so I'm gonna leave that alone but I've done tone now I'm gonna do color so I'm gonna go to show more and I'm gonna go to color adjustment now for this color adjustment, I'm going to grab this little tool right here. And when I grab that tool, if I just click on a color, you'll notice that it doesn't change. It doesn't actually change that color until I click on this eyedropper and click and move. Now you start to see that changing. By default, it's going to set the hue to be what's, what's edited. So that's a good tip because there's a lot of times where I used to click this and I used to click on a color thinking it was going to select a color for me. But if you don't move to the left or to the right, sometimes it doesn't happen. It doesn't do anything. So we'll bring that over just a little bit in our oranges and we'll bump up the saturation in our oranges a little bit. Again, we want this to look like a daytime shot. OK, and we might even make those a little bit darker. Let me go into my reds. I'll boost up the saturation in those reds a little bit. And that looks good good like that and now I'm gonna go into I'm gonna see what color this is here that's my yellows I want them to be more on the green side so I'm gonna move them the hue over to the green a little bit and maybe bump up that saturation just a little bit so that looks pretty good here's our before here's our after again the image is already looking better but now what we're gonna do is we're gonna hop on over into effects and I'm gonna show you how I replace skies using the texture filter so go ahead and press add filter and go to textures now, like I said, I'm going to show you how to import my textures when this video is over. So just pay attention to this now. Don't worry too much about importing uh, these things. OK, so we're going to go to category and my category down here is actually called clouds. Notice how here there's something that says my textures. So I'm going to click on clouds and by default, it almost looks good. It's a subtle addition of clouds to the top. But what's happening here is it's actually applying that to the entire image. You see it happening in the foreground here too. So I'm basically using the texture filter to apply clouds to my image, but it's applying clouds to the entire image and not just the sky. So there's a couple things that we need to do in order to make that work. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select a cloud layer. Uh, I'm going to go into my textures here. The category is clouds and that cloud layer. Let's change that to let's try this one. I like that one. And now instead of the mode being subtle, I'm going to change that to replace. OK, now you're starting to see that those clouds are everywhere and it doesn't look very good. But if you've ever watched any of my tutorials, there's one thing that I always flaunt when it comes to on one photo raw, and that is the power of the blend settings, the blending options that you have here. So I'm going to go and click on this little gear right here. And when it says apply to, I'm going to change that to highlights. So now it's just applying that to my sky in the background, but it's not looking very good. And why is that? That's because the range of the highlights hasn't been dictated. So when I move this range over, now you'll start to see that all those clouds start to fill in the sky because I'm telling on one photo raw that, Hey, you know what? I, I see what you've selected as the highlights, but I need more. So I'm going to increase that range. And there we go. It's starting to look pretty good right there. Just about like that. Okay. One thing I want you to do here though, and this is going to seem absolutely crazy, but it's going to help you with your sky replacement as if you come down here to colorize, if we click on that colorize button, watch what happens. It turns the whole image red. What the heck is going on? Why would I even tell you to do that? Well, I'm telling you to do that because it makes it very easy for you now to brush out the things that you don't want this texture to apply itself because I'm telling these clouds not just to apply themselves to the sky, but also to apply themselves to the foreground as well. 
And you might be wondering why I didn't go into the perfect brush, brush out the sky, and then apply the texture. And there's a reason why. There's a method to my madness here. And that method mainly has to do with the edges of my image here. So when I zoom in and I see those edges of my image, I need to increase that range so that, that range starts to cover the edge areas, which if I were to just make a mask of the sky, it wouldn't be blending itself over these edges of the image very well. It would just be a mask for the sky and it would be rather hard edged. And I can promise you this, it would not look very good. So now what I need to do is I need to open up the mask of this texture. So click on this little plus icon here. This is going to get us into the masking brush. So I can brush with a big brush now anywhere on here that I don't want those clouds to be. And I'm going to use the big brush, not the perfect brush until I get to a point where I want to get rid of uh, this, this area up in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my brush a little bit smaller. And now I'll come up here to the perfect brush, click on toggle perfect brush. And you can make your brush size larger or smaller by pressing the right bracket key to make it bigger and the left bracket key to make it smaller. And now I'm going to brush in here and use the perfect brush to get the foreground area out of there. And I'm using that red color because that red color shows me exactly where it is. You can change this color to anything you want though. I could change this color to let's say cyan or maybe even magenta or something even brighter, something that I can actually see where that area is on my image. I think those that bright red area is probably the best area though. So we'll just go ahead and leave it at that big, bright, bold red up there. And we might even get a little bit bolder here. Just bring this all the way over to that red. Okay, big, bold red. And what we're gonna do is just keep painting on here, keep painting on here and then make your brush smaller as you go through so you don't end up going over areas that you don't want to go over into the sky. And we'll just keep brushing and brushing and brushing. All right, so if at this point you think you've got everything, you can press the O key and it will show you exactly what you have for your mask here. So I can keep brushing until this stuff starts to go away. I didn't start with the O key first, and there's a reason why. If I started with the O key first, I wouldn't be able to see anything. That's why I turned that colorized layer on first so that I could actually see what it is that I'd be painting out in this image. Okay, keep painting, keep painting, keep painting. And it's starting to look good. Now what you'll notice here is that I'm not actually using uh, layers for this. I'm using I'm using effects for this whole sky replacement. I think that's pretty cool. We can use a texture layer to replace our sky and our image. Pretty, pretty awesome. And there's a reason why I'm doing that too. I'll tell you that here in a second too. There's always a reason for the things that I do. And you know, you think, well, why wouldn't you just do this in layers? Well, I'll show you. Okay, so now we can press O to get out of that mask. And we can also turn that colorized layer off. So that's looking pretty good. All right, so at this point, it does look a little bit fake. And that's okay, because we can fix it. If we come up here to the opacity of this, we can see the opacity that we have our sky set to here. But we also have a brightness setting here. I can change the brightness of this. This is affecting the brightness of just this texture, not the whole image, just this texture. We can also adjust the hue and the saturation of that sky back there. We can make it a, a deeper, more rich blue. Maybe drop that saturation a little bit so that it's not competing with the rest of our image. Now I will tell you this, if I zoom in here, that edge that you're seeing in the mask is not as bad as it actually looks in the photograph. This is because I have some pretty bad chromatic aberration happening here. So if you look at this, we can't really see a good mask preview. That's why it's always a good idea to zoom in. You'll notice that everywhere else in the image though, it looks pretty darn good. And now there's another way that we can actually kind of fade that in a little bit. And that's also using another masking technique. So if I were to click on this mask right here, I can go ahead and hop over here and press this mask button. Now I'm going to press O before I do that. And then I'm going to click the masking bug. I'm going to click right here. Now you'll notice that now we have a black mask up at the top. If I just turn and rotate this, look what happens. Now what I can do is I can feather that in. I can feather that in really nicely there from the bottom up onto the top. Because a lot of times what happens in our images anyway is we get a transition from the ground area, the horizontal area of our photograph where the horizon line is, that transitions up into the sky and it looks more natural that way anyway. 
So we can see that there's a much more natural progression now between the foreground and the background using that mask. Now that does help. It helps me in this in this case because there is a lot of white in the background of this image. If you had other clouds in your image, it might not be that uh, that helpful, but that definitely helped in my case here. So let's go ahead and get back into our texture. So now that we have the clouds pretty well done, we got a good mask on those clouds. I can adjust the opacity of those clouds right here, or I can adjust the master opacity of this entire texture layer here, or I could come in and I could adjust the saturation of the blue sky in the background there. Um, there's all kinds of things I can do here. I can even transform this. I can make the scale much larger. So that the scale of this cloud gets much larger than it actually is, but I think it's good right about there. I can flip and rotate this too. So I can rotate this 90 degrees clockwise and keep going all the way around. That looks really trippy and go all the way around. And then I can maybe flip it vertically vertically, flip it horizontally or flip it vertically to see exactly uh, how I want these clouds to be matched up on my image. So it's a really cool technique for replacing our skies. It doesn't stop there. I even have more blending settings here. I can blend my shadows a little bit more here from those skies. I can blend the mid tones a little bit more with that sky and I can blend the highlights a little bit more what's underneath with that sky also. So don't rule out these tools because while I don't need them in this image, you might need them in the image that you're working with. Now I'm not too concerned about those clouds that are underneath there. It, it looks, it looks all right, but sometimes those clouds underneath wouldn't look okay. And then you You'd have to do some other things to your image in order to make it work like maybe turn this layer off and start clone stamping some of those clouds out but i think it looks pretty natural here and i think it looks pretty good so i'm going to keep it and i'm almost to the point where i can call this image done but what i need to do first is i need to do something on the artistic effect level to pull the whole image together to make the highlights on this rock have something incorporated with the highlights in the rest of the image because it will help uh, our, our vision for the photograph. So I'm going to add a filter and I'm going to add a split tone. And with the split tone, what I like about the split tone is what it's actually doing for me. I'm going to go ahead and close down our texture layer here. The split tone is allowing me to apply this color to my highlights and it's allowing me to apply this color to my shadow areas. So I'll bring the amounts down pretty low. The only reason why I'm doing this is to incorporate some type of colors in my foreground and my background. Do I have to use this tan color? Absolutely not. If I wanted to, I could come in and I could use a more reddish color. I can, this is where you basically get to set the time of the day and I can press okay with maybe that red. That looks pretty good. And if I wanted to, I could change the color of the shadows a little bit more too, instead of making them that blue, I could then come in and make them um, maybe a, a deeper burgundy or something like that to match the highlight areas. Maybe bring that color down a little bit. And that looks pretty good. One last thing I want to add to this to tie the whole image together is a vignette. And I like this big softy vignette, love that big softy. But what I'm going to do with that big softy is I'm going to go into the gear and I'm going to protect my highlights from it. So move this all the way over till our highlights are protected and then even drop the opacity of it just a little bit. I'm going to do one more thing. If you saw that tutorial recently that I did where I added like this spotlight type of look to my image, I'm going to, I'm going to do that with the local adjustment. I'm going to click on the local adjustments here. And with this local adjustment, I'm going to click on the masking bug and I'm going to change this to center. And then I'm going to click right here. So basically that's saying that the center of this image is getting darker because we have the exposure set to darker. So I'm going to bring that up. I'm going to brighten it up. Okay. And I'm going to add some warmth to it. All right. Maybe even add a little bit of tint to it and then even a little bit more saturation to the center of this photograph. But I'm going to come to this gear and I'm going to protect my shadow areas from that. So we got this nice spotlight that we can move around that protects our shadows and just brightens up the whole image. We can make this even smaller if we wanted to and then feather this out a little bit bigger. And that looks really good just like that. Okay, cool. So let's go to the overall settings. Let's go back to the very beginning and develop. Here is our before and here's our after. Here's our before, here's our after. We added some interest up there with the sky and with those clouds. But I did tell you that there was a very specific reason as to why I was replacing my sky in effects. And you want to know why that is? Because at any time, if I hop back over into effects and I click on that texture layer, where are you? Here you are. And come down to this texture layer and I click here. Here's the category as clouds. 
but which texture I'm using. I'm using my clouds one. Watch this. If I go here and I click my clouds two, look at that. What it's doing is it's replacing the cloud only. It's using all the settings that are right here in this texture layer and all the settings in the image, but allows me to change any one of my cloud images over right on the fly on this image whenever I want to. It's a pretty cool little technique there because if I didn't really like the clouds that I had in uh, that in my clouds one, I could change it to my clouds five and I could again change and transform the scale of this. And I think that looks really good as either my clouds five or my clouds one or even just regular my clouds. And again, these are my clouds. That's why they're labeled my clouds. So I did tell you I was going to show you how to import the clouds that I just gave you. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to press the import button. We want to import these to where? Is it a background, a border? Is it, it's a texture. So we'll open this up. You see that mine is already labeled clouds here. Let's just click on textures and we'll say import. It will ask you where you want to import them in a second here. So wherever you have this saved, the, the images that I just gave you for this tutorial, mine are on the desktop and they're right in here and they're Blake's clouds. I can grab all of these and press open. It's going to ask you what category do you want to put it in? Well, I could add them right to this category, but instead I'm going to add a category for the sake of this tutorial and we'll call that category Blake's clouds and we press OK. It says the import job has processed five items and there were no errors. So now when we press close and we go to category, you're going to see another category here called Blake's clouds. That's what I just imported two seconds ago right here via this tutorial. And there you have it. You don't need to use layers. You don't need to use Photoshop. You don't need to use anything crazy to replace a sky in on one photo raw. If you use the texture filter in effects, pretty cool stuff, pretty powerful stuff. But just remember, it's always a good idea to also put that split tone on there so that we have some type of unifying color that pulls the whole canvas together. And it doesn't hurt to add a nice little big soft vignette there. That might be a little bit too much. Maybe drop that opacity a little bit. So let's go back to our very beginning. We took a photo that was just before sunrise that was rather dim and dismal and didn't have much going for it. And we made it look like it was taken probably closer to the evening or the afternoon. So I certainly hope you like this on one workflow. My name is Blake Rudis and please do not forget to download those clouds and import them into your version of on one photo raw so that you can replace clouds pretty easily on those boring skies that could probably use them anyway.